If you have ever flown Virgin Airlines, you have heard a song. Uh, Right before you take off, Virgin Airlines plays a song. It's called, We're All in This Together. Here are some of the lyrics. Flying through the air, clear skies and bad weather, like birds of a feather, we're all in this together. Hey, you talking out loud, we're all in this together. Hey, lady, spring that perfume cloud. That ever happened to you? <laughs> lady, spring that perfume cloud, we're all in this together. Hey, kid, kicking that seat. <laughs> hey, guy with the five burritos to eat. <laughs> hey, soft drink sipper. Hey, overzealous nail clipper. Reality stars, men from Mars, guys sprawling like a hog. Lady snoring like a log. And don't make fun of the guy in leather. <laughs> We're all in this together. Many of you know we're working our way through this dynamic letter penned by Paul called Ephesians. We're in the sixth part of this sermon series that we're calling, Who Does God Say We Are? And today, it's as though we could summarize our reading from Ephesians 4, 1 through 6, by envisioning all of us on an airplane, on the same flight, with the same pilot, with the same destination, flying through the air, clear skies and bad weather, like birds of a feather, we're all in this together. That's what Paul says as we ask the question, who does God say we are today from Ephesians 4, 1 through 6? That's easy, Paul says. We're all in this. All of us, all of us, especially you, 18, (laughs) we're all in this together. Let's get our bearings in terms of Ephesians, kind of see how the big picture lies out. My first five sermons in this series were from chapters 1 through 3. Chapters 1 through 3 would be all about our wealth in Christ, our spiritual wealth. Paul throws around liberally, generously, words like grace and mercy and chosen and forgiven and love. Oh my, we are rich in Christ. That would be the first three chapters. Our wealth in Christ. But beginning in chapter 4, verse 1, which is part of our reading today, right? Paul turns a corner. Paul then moves from our wealth in Christ, the the transforming gospel of Jesus, to our what? To our walk in Christ, our, our Christian life, to the implications of the wealth. It's as though Paul moves from, from doctrine, chapters 1 through 3, to duty, chapters 4 through 6. From belief to behavior, from the root of salvation, the grace of God in Jesus, to the fruits of salvation. Or, as this slide shows, from our wealth to our walk. That's how Paul begins our reading from Ephesians 4 verse 1. He says, as a prisoner for the Lord, I urge you to walk. Walk, it's a word that Paul uses six times in the last three chapters of Ephesians. Walk, the implications of being in Christ. Walk how? Worthy of the calling you have received. And what an awesome gospel, grace-filled calling we have. The first item Paul takes up then in terms of our walk, would be what? Of all things, Paul takes up church unity. Uh, Be prepared this morning because you're going to get a different view of the church and the church's unity and the church's calling and the church's mission. But Paul, in the next five verses in Ephesians chapter 4, takes up church unity. That's how we are to walk, united with one another. Did you realize that when Jesus brought you to himself, he brought you also into relationship with other people, right? 
A lot of times we just want Jesus, right? I just want Jesus. I don't want all the mess of the people to dwell above with those we love. Oh, that will be the glory. To dwell below with those we know, well, that's another story. (laughs) When Jesus brings you to himself, he brings you into the church. The church, the church is not just a organization of like-minded community leaders. The church is not just an activist group. The church is not people who are just friends. No, 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 no. If you think the church is just a human organization, if you think these 18, well, they're just joining the church like they're joining Little League or like you would join scouts, or like you would join a sorority or fraternity. If that's what you think is going on today, folks, you're going to miss it all. If you think the church is just a human organization, then my hunch is, my hunch is, that that you kind of just sit on the sidelines. You're just here to observe. Don't get too close. (laughs) Don't get too close. My hunch is if you see the church as just another organization that you can join like the Republican Party, then sooner or later you know what's going to happen to you. As a church, you're going to look at it and you're going to say, this is a bore. This is a snore. This is a chore. And and you're probably going to say, someday, what? (laughs) No more. No more. Paul says the church is a body. Got it? Body. He does that in Ephesians 4, verse 4. There is no greater love than between brothers and sisters in Christ. We are cemented together by the very blood of Jesus, which means that this unity that we're talking about this morning, this unity is a greater unity than you have at work, on your bowling league, In your Little League baseball team, this unity is greater than family unity. Get this. This unity is greater than husband and wife unity. And you say, whoa, time out here. That's pretty uncomfortable. Because I just like to think of the church as just another organization that I can join. And you see, that's pretty easy, isn't it? If the church is just a human organization, then when I get ticked off or I get tired of the whole thing, I can what? I can just walk away. I just walk away. I understand most of us think of the church this way. It's easy for me too. The church is a human organization, and you know, you can come when you want, you can leave when you want. It's just like belonging to the American Legion, right? Wrong. <laughs> Flying through the air like birds of a feather. We're all, we are all in this together. That's what Paul teaches today. In fact, he says that there are two ways to look at church unity. The first we're going to look at is called what? Promoting unity. Promoting unity. By what? Through our behavior. Through what we do. What you and I do as Christians actually promotes unity. So let's take a look at the next verse. Ephesians 4, verse 2. Paul says, be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. And by the way, you can apply all these truths to your marriage, to your family, to your workplace, but Paul applies it primarily to the church. If you don't want to be disconnected to people, if you want to live in harmony with people, it all begins with what characteristic? Paul says be completely humble, not just a little bit humble, uh, not like this bumper sticker I saw a few years ago, I bet I'm twice as humble as you are. No, 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 no. (laughs) Completely humble. You see, the opposite of humility would be what? What's the antonym? Pride. Pride. Spell out pride in your mind, all right? What's the middle letter in pride? What would that be? I. 
I. Pride, you see, is all about I and me and myself and, of course, mine. You want to destroy unity wherever you're at, then just live in pride, and especially in churches, right? I don't, pride says, I really don't need this. I don't need communion. I don't need preaching, especially from Lessing, right? Don't say amen to that, please. Thank you very much. I really don't need all of this. I'll show up on my terms when I feel like it. The opposite, though, of pride is humility. Humility looks at the church and says, I need the church. The church has what I need. The church has Jesus. The church has Jesus' body and blood. The church has baptism. Oh, I desperately need what the church offers. And I need brothers and sisters in Christ. So the first characteristic of what? Promoting unity through our behavior, that's the point we're under right now, is what? Humility. Second item Paul picks up is to be gentle. Gentle. Well, what's that look like? In Paul's day, gentleness was probably better understood as strength under control. Uh, That's it. That's how that word was used in Paul's day, translated gentle in our translation this morning. It means strength under control. And it was used in context like wind blowing a ship along. Or it would be used in context of a wild horse that had just been broken. You see, wind by itself can be destructive. And a wild horse, my, that can destroy you too. But you see, it was strength under control. Do you want to be an agent of unity and togetherness in your life? Then it's strength under control. It's just not strength. See, it's just not wind. It's just not a horse. But they're tamed. They can be used. Strength under control. It doesn't mean that you walk into a relationship and say, my way or the highway and get the heck out of the way. Let me know how that works for you. (laughs) Be gentle. Use your strength, but put it under control. The next thing Paul uses to describe this unity is what? Patience. Fascinating word in the original Greek. I've transliterated it for you. It's a compound of two Greek words, and they actually come in English, don't they? Macro, thumia. That's the Greek word for patience. Macro means what? Long, right? Big, as opposed to micro, which is short and teeny and small, insignificant. Macro and then thumia. That's where we get words like thermostat (laughs) and thermometer. Thumia means what? Heat. Heat. (laughs) To be patient is to be long on the heat. You have a long fuse. You don't blow up over everything. And if you do, my guess is you've got a real lonely, isolated existence. Macrothumia. Get a long fuse. And then Paul says to bear with each other in love. Because inevitably in relationships, people say things that make you cringe. And people make decisions that make you crazy. And you want to grab your marbles and you want to go home. But Paul says, no, bear with each other in love. Maybe you heard about Joe. Joe was dying. Joe was in a hospital room, but Joe had been very good friends with Bill, uh, really best friends in church. They always would sit in the same pew. Their their families did the, the same kind of activities after church, but that was years ago. Now Joe and Bill, they're at odds with each other. There's no unity there. But Joe's dying, as I said. And so he gets a hold of Bill on his cell phone. He says, Bill, I'm dying. Would you please come and visit me in the hospital? Joe uh, uh, pleads with Bill. So Bill shows up. Joe says, you know what? I I, want to make amends. 
It's time for us to let bygones be bygones. And so they shake hands. And Bill says, fair enough. I forgive you. And Bill starts to leave. And Joe, on his deathbed, he he says, Bill, 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 (laughs) hold on. Hold on. Don't take another step. Bill, you need to know that if I get better, this doesn't count. (laughs) My love and patience and gentleness will only go so far. No, 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 no. Paul says in the first couple verses of Ephesians 4, promote unity. How do you do that? Through your behavior, that kind of behavior. But there's a second part to this message. We also preserve unity. We preserve unity through our beliefs, through our beliefs. See, it's easy. Some churches say, It's all about what you believe, and other churches say, oh, no, 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 no. It's all about what you do, your behavior, and Paul won't let us live that easily. (laughs) It's both, isn't it? Church unity is through my behavior and my beliefs. That's what he says in the next verse. He says, be eager to keep the unity of the Spirit. Preserve the unity through the bond of peace. What is our belief? How could we kind of just boil this down? Paul does this for us in an amazing verse. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 20, he says, this is our belief. This is what these 18 are ready to live for and die for. This is it all boiled down into one verse. We are built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. What does that mean? That means that we are Scripture alone people. The prophetic and apostolic word, Genesis through Revelation, this is our belief. Here we stand on the prophetic and apostolic truth of God's Word. And what is the center of that Word? Paul says it's who? It's Jesus. It's Jesus. This picks it up pretty good, doesn't it? What Jesus? Jesus who is Israel's king, so has a crown on his head. And this Jesus, this Jesus is the crucified one. That's why there's a cross there. We are not only Christ-centered in this church, we are cross-focused. This is our cornerstone. It is still, (laughs) still about Jesus. Where does Paul get this idea that Christ is the cornerstone? He is the rock of our salvation. He gets it from Psalm 118, verses 22 and 23 where the psalmist says, the stone, are you with me here? The stone that has been rejected. What does rejection look like? It looks like what? It looks like that, the cross, where he was rejected, spit upon, scourged, abandoned, spiked, and left for dead. And he did all of that for you. The stone the builders rejected, Psalm 118, verse 22, has become the cornerstone. (laughs) This rejected Jesus is alive. They saw him on the third day. There are eyewitnesses. There's a written record. And billions of lives have been transformed in the name of Jesus. He is the cornerstone. The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, verse 23 in Psalm 118. The Lord did it, didn't he? And it is still marvelous in our eyes. Wow. This is what we're willing to live for and die for and take our confirmation pledges. Are you with me, brothers and sisters, all 18 of you? Can you look at me in the eye and say, yes, sir, read Bob or Billy or Pete, or in this case, read lesson? This Jesus is the doorway to our deliverance. He is the pathway to peace. He is the gateway to glory. His mercy is matchless, his grace is enough, his word is sufficient, and his love is never-ending. We are built on the foundation 
of Christ and the apostolic and prophetic scriptures. Do you see that? I'll do it one more time so you can get it. There's the cornerstone. And there would be the scriptures that tell us about this loving, marvelous Savior. And then what happens? Oh, here we are. We are now bricks in the building, like birds of a feather. You know where we're going, right? We're all in this together. The Holy Spirit has inspired this faith in Jesus, right? He does it through His Word. He brings gospel gifts through baptism and, of course, through the body and blood of the Holy Supper. This is our belief. This is where we find unity in Jesus, in His Word, and how He comes to us through the means of gospel grace. Paul puts it this way. Once Christ is my cornerstone, once I am built in this building, then I have unity. What kind of unity? Sevenfold perfect unity. That's what he says at the second part of our reading. There's one body, Paul says. We're back to what? <laughs> We're a unity. It's not just a human organization. We are the body of Christ, and they're just one of them. Paul says there's one spirit. He goes on to say there's one hope. Isn't that great? In this hopeless world where people get so down and depressed and in the dumps, in this world we have hope. Folks, there is no other organization on the planet that has hope like the church of Jesus Christ. <laughs> Wow, wow. Jeremiah 29, 11, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans to give you hope. Eighteen of you, you have hope in a hopeless, God-forsaken society. And there's one hope. There's one hope. Paul goes on. There's one Lord. There's one Lord. You're not the pilot, and neither am I. Jesus is. He's in charge. He's the cornerstone. There's one faith. There are not multiple faiths out there. There are not multiple ways to get to heaven. There are not multiple truths. No, there's one scriptural and apostolic, Christ-centered, cross-focused faith, and you're in it right now. Paul says there's one baptism that unites us together. And finally, he says in this perfect seven, one God and Father. Father. That brings us full circle, doesn't it? Father implies we're in the same family. Ruth and Valida Katie are Lutherans. Did you know that? They're Lutherans. They're Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod Lutherans from Minden, Minnesota. They were born in 1984, and they were hooked from their waist to their sternum. They share the same heart. Oh, they're different. They're, they're twins. They have a different nervous system. They have different personalities. But they are hooked together, literally. Literally. You want a picture of what I'm preaching about this morning? Here it is. Here it is. Cooperation <laughs> is what? Essential. Essential. Separation is not an option. This is our life in Christ. Like birds of a feather. <laughs> We're what? We're joined. We're hooked. You bleed, I bleed. You cry, I cry. You have needs, I have needs. Like birds of a feather, we're all in this together. Which brings us back to Virgin Airlines. Here's my take on what they do based upon what Paul teaches us in Ephesians chapter 4. Flying through the air... 
Clear skies and bad weather, <laughs> like birds of a feather, we're all in this together. Hey, you who are so proud, we're all in this together. Hey, lady, spring that gossip cloud, we're all in this together. Hey, kid who won't greet, hey, guy who thinks he's way too neat, hey, big lipper, hey, non-loving reputation clipper, <laughs> reality stars, men are from Mars. Guy selfish like a hog, gal sleeping like a log, and don't make fun of the guy in lather, because we're all, all, especially you 18, we're all in this together. And we're going to stand, and we're going to celebrate, and we're going to sing about it. So let's do that right now. <laughs> 